in and welcome to Redeemer Christian Church. If you would, please have your seat on this Easter Sunday morning. Again, welcome to Redeemer. My name is David Ritchie, and I serve as the lead pastor here at Redeemer Christian Church. We are delighted that you're here this morning with us, whether you're a member, a regular guest, um, a person that's here for the very first time, perhaps because you're seeing someone that you know and love be baptized. Uh, we want to wish you all a sincerely very happy Easter. If you're a guest and this is your first time at Redeemer, one thing that we would love to know is we'd love to know that you're here. One way you can help us with that is you can fill out a connect card that should be found on the back of the pew right in front of you. If you would like us to be able to get in touch with you, to connect with you, to look for opportunities to get you connected to our church congregation, uh, we would love to do that. You can drop off um, that connect card in the giving box before you leave today. Also, too, I know on a Sunday like this, there's a lot of different guests, perhaps people that are here and you do not yet have a church home, a home congregation. I just want to let you know that we would sincerely love to have you join Redeemer Christian Church, to be a part of our mission, to see what God is doing. Our, our mission really is to declare the gospel of Jesus Christ with our words, to display the gospel of Jesus Christ with our lives to our neighbors and to the nations. And so we would invite you um, to join us in that mission to find your place, um, to find a place of belonging, um, because you're certainly welcome and you're certainly wanted here. Today really is the holiest day of the Christian year. It's the holiest day of the Christian calendar. It's a day that we remember that though Jesus Christ, though our Lord died on the cross for the sins of humanity, he did not stay dead. <laughs> Death has no dominion over Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has risen, and he will never die again. And because of that truth, yes, because of that truth, we have a hope. We have hope for our lives. We have a hope for eternity. And right now, I want us to stop and take a step back and, and consider this from a little bit of a different angle because it's somewhat easy to, yes, believe that resurrection is a profound truth, that it's a powerful truth. But for many of us who grew up, especially in the Bible Belt, but even if you just grew up in the Western world, the truth of resurrection is a profound truth, but it's also a very familiar truth. Indeed, it's a truth that is so powerful that has literally shaped the contours of human history. We now divide human history into two different epochs because of the intrusion of Jesus Christ into human history and because he overcame death. But if we could take a few steps back and, and try to enter into the mindset of what would it really be like to encounter the resurrected Christ for the very first time? What would it be like to be the, actually the very first person that witnesses that Jesus Christ has overcome the very power of death? Well, it so happens that all four gospels testify that the same person was indeed the same person in all four gospels that was able to witness Jesus as he came out of the grave, that was able to witness Jesus for the first time as the resurrected Lord. And that person is none other than Mary Magdalene. And so we're going to turn to her story today. And the reason we're going to look at Mary Magdalene's story is I, I want us to try to enter into her story, to try to place ourselves in her shoes, to try to be able to look at the risen Christ Jesus through her eyes. And I believe that through the power of the words of sacred scripture, we will be able to do just that. And so if you do have your Bibles, I would invite you to open them up to the gospel according to John. We're in John chapter 20. One of the rhythms of worship that we have here at Redeemer Christian Church is we want to especially acknowledge the authority and the power and the perfection of God's word. And so one of the ways that we do that is whenever we read passages of the scripture, we stand as a way of honoring read God's holy word. And so if you would please stand with me today on this Easter morning as we read this testimony to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Our passage today comes from John chapter 20. We're going to begin in verse 1, and then we're going to read verses 11 through 18. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Verse 11. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? 
Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. This is God's holy word. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Almighty and everlasting God, thank you for the truth of your resurrection. Lord, I know this can be a familiar idea. I know it can be a familiar truth. I pray that you would illuminate our understanding and open our eyes to see resurrection for the wonder that it is. We pray this in the name of our resurrected King, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You can have your seat today. The hope of resurrection is the hope of the Christian gospel. The resurrection and the gospel of the resurrection of Jesus Christ does not help marginally bad people become slightly better people. No, it means that those who are spiritually dead in their sin can become living and new people in the power of Jesus Christ. You see, the gospel is is not just meant to be an abstract theological truth that we somehow know with our minds but has no effect on our lives. No, the gospel is a deeply personal reality. That means that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is intended to have deeply personal implications. And as today we walk through this very famous Easter Sunday passage, I want to explore five life-changing truths that flow from this truth of resurrection. And I pray that as we encounter these truths through the eyes of Mary Magdalene, that you too would be able to encounter the risen Christ today. The first truth that flows from the resurrection of Jesus is that Jesus meets you in your brokenness. Let's look again at verses 1 and 11. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. Right here, we're just introducing the scene that is before us. It's just dawn before a Sunday morning, and a woman named Mary has gone to visit a garden tomb. Tears stream down her face. She aches with a sleeplessness and a grief that is almost too unendurable to bear. In the last few days, Mary's world has fallen apart. She was a follower of Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus, the great Jewish teacher, Jesus, the rabbi, Jesus, the prophet, Jesus, the miracle maker. And Mary, along with the disciples, had hoped against all hope that Jesus of Nazareth was the long-awaited Messiah, that he was the anointed liberator king who had come, sent by God, to bring God's kingdom to earth. See, more than that, Jesus was Mary's dear friend. Mary loved Jesus with all of her heart. She was a woman with a past. Some would have called her crazy. Some might have even called her damaged goods, but Jesus noticed Mary. Jesus was different than everyone else. And when Mary was in a dark place, Jesus delivered her from a demonic oppression. No one had ever loved Mary like Jesus loved her. And Mary wanted to follow Jesus wherever he might lead her. You see, just a few days ago, Jesus Christ of Nazareth was arrested. He was beaten. He was mocked. He was condemned. He was tortured. He was murdered on a Roman cross as an enemy of a state and a common criminal. Mary had personally witnessed the horror of Jesus' suffering. She had witnessed the heartbreak of his death. Indeed, her world had fallen apart. You see, things are about to change in the most dramatic way possible, in the most dramatic way imaginable for Mary Magdalene. Mary is about to become the very first Christian. She's going to be the first person to actually encounter and believe in the resurrected Jesus. Now, this should surprise us. As I said before, 
Mary does have a very sinful, a very messy past. More than that, the fact that she is a woman and that she is the one that's privileged enough to be the first person to witness the resurrected Jesus would have been profoundly surprising in an ancient context. See, in the ancient Roman Empire, particularly in the first century and in the ancient Near East, the words of a woman were not viewed very seriously at all. In fact, in this particular culture, the testimony of a woman was not even legally admissible in a court of law. But still, God chooses Mary. He chooses her to be the first one to witness Jesus' victory over death. Jesus meets Mary in her deepest brokenness, and he saves her by his unfathomable grace. As it turns out, this is how God works. This is how the gospel works. Pastor Timothy Keller says it this way. Jesus specifically chose a woman, not a man, chose a reformed mental patient, not a pillar of the community, chose one of the support team, not one of the leaders, to be the first Christian. How much clearer can he be? He's saying it doesn't matter who you are or what you've done. My salvation is not based on pedigree. It's not based on moral attainments, raw talent, level of effort, or track record. I've not come to call those who are strong, but to call those who are weak. And I'm not mainly your teacher, but your savior. I'm here to save you, not by your work, but by my work. Real Christian faith believes that Jesus saves through his death and resurrection so that we can be accepted by sheer grace. That's the gospel. The good news that we are saved by the work of Christ through grace. People of God, that means the Christian gospel is not at all about what you can do so that you can get to God. It is the announcement of what God has done to come to you, to save you. This means no matter who you are, no matter where you are in life, no matter how broken you are, no matter your pain, no matter your disappointment, no matter your doubt, no matter your fear, no matter your failure, Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, can meet you today. The second truth that flows from resurrection is that Jesus isn't who you think he is. He is so much better. We'll continue to look at the text. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? And supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. Now, this is extraordinary for several reasons. Number one, if I am to witness two angels standing before me, that's a big moment in life, right? That's, that's, that would be a pretty amazing sight in of itself, but Mary is in such a state of surreal, hysterical grief that when she encounters two angels, all she can do is frantically ask where the body of Jesus is. She's very much still in shock. And then when she sees the very real, the very alive Jesus, she assumes that he's a gardener. Notice that Mary Magdalene is not even considering the resurrection as a potential option right now. It's not even on the list of possibilities. She knew a lot about Jesus. She even loved Jesus. But up until this point, Mary had still not recognized the most fundamental and the most important truth about Jesus. To Mary, Jesus was a great man who made her life so much better. But she did not yet know and worship him as Lord and God. Maybe along your life's journey, you rejected Jesus perhaps because the church wounded you. Maybe to you, Jesus is a symbol of people who are filled with pride and hypocrisy and self-righteousness, and if that's you, I get it, I really do. There have been times where Christians have been very poor advertisements, very poor spokesmen for our Savior. But might I submit, perhaps the version of Jesus that you rejected is not the real Jesus. Maybe the real Jesus is different. Maybe the real Jesus is so much better. For others, it's very easy to stumble into thinking of Jesus not as the rightful king of our lives, but as a nice teacher, a 
positive example, a nice, inspiring personal life coach, or perhaps even a genie who grants us blessings and wishes if we pray to him the right way. You see, the truth of resurrection changes all of that. The truth of eternity entering into time and history, the truth of the infinite entering into finite human form changes all of that. Jesus changes all of our misconceptions about him. As C.S. Lewis once famously wrote, I'm trying here to prevent anyone from saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. The third truth that flows from the resurrection is that Jesus knows your name. This is a mystifying, a humbling truth that the infinite God who spun the galaxies into motion knows you by name. And here in John 20, the God of all creation speaks the name of one he loves. Verse 16 reads, And Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. This is indeed the single moment that changes everything for Mary Magdalene. For whatever reason, she has not been able to recognize Jesus up until this point. Maybe she cannot clearly see in the dimness of the early light. Maybe she is spiritually prevented from acknowledging the truth of the man standing before her as the resurrected Jesus. Maybe the resurrection is just simply so far outside of her paradigm of the possible that she can't dare to hope Jesus is alive. But all her fears, all her sorrows, all her shame, all her doubts, all her darkness melt away the moment that Jesus says her name. The good shepherd calls, and his sheep hear his voice. Like a shard of sunlight that breaks through the darkness, the voice of God pierces through the clouds of Mary's doubt and awakens her. Immediately, she recognizes him and responds to him by calling him Rabboni, which means teacher and even master. This is the miraculous moment that still happens for those who come to truly know and recognize Jesus for who he is today. Theologians will oftentimes call this magical moment the effectual calling. It's the moment when the Holy Spirit of God illuminates our hearts to understand, to know, to believe, and to trust in the gospel of Jesus Christ. For me, personally, as a one-time agnostic college student, deeply, deeply burnt out on religion, deeply cynical towards all religious hypocrisy, my effectual calling came the moment as I was reading scripture in my college dorm room. And I was able to see and behold the wonder of the gospel. It's a moment I can hardly even describe other than in that moment I knew that the Holy Spirit had turned the light on. And I went from knowing a lot about Jesus to truly knowing Jesus, to truly loving Jesus, and committing all of my life to following Jesus. I do believe that there's some of you here this morning that need to hear these words. Perhaps you've grown up in church. Maybe you would even say that you believe things about the Bible. You might even believe that Jesus truly existed and that it was in history. You might even believe he died on the cross and even rose again. But you do not yet believe that he did that for you. If that is you, I want you to know that you have an opportunity. You have a moment to know God personally. I want you to know that through his word, he is indeed calling your name today. The fourth truth that flows from resurrection, Jesus has made union with God possible. We'll look back at the text. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. This 
This is a verse that I think is really easy to misunderstand. We might be tempted to believe that Jesus is telling Mary Magdalene that, no, you can't touch me anymore. I'm too holy for you. You're going to somehow contaminate me. But quite the contrary. In fact, later on in the same chapter, we're going to see Jesus openly invite many of his disciples to touch his once crucified, now very living body so that they might believe in the miracle of resurrection. What's happening is that Mary in this moment is grasping Jesus. She won't let go of Jesus. She has already lost Jesus once and she never wants to lose him again. So she's clinging to him. She is grasping him. Jesus lovingly and gently tells her that she must let him go. Now, why does he tell her this? It's because Jesus knows that he must eventually ascend to his Father in heaven. That there's a throne on heaven that he must reign from. And that from that throne on heaven, he will send forth his Holy Spirit to dwell in the hearts of all who believe on him. Jesus is telling Mary, Mary, I have something so much better I have something so much better for you. A day is coming when I'm not just going to be physically around you. My spirit will dwell within you. I will abide in you, and you will abide in me. And through me, God will not just be a God. He will be your God. He will not just be a heavenly father. He will be your heavenly father. See, this means that when we become a Christian, we get something so much more than just a mere relationship with God. When you become a Christian, you are brought into spiritual union with the triune creator of the cosmos and the author of our redemption. You're united with the very power of Christ's resurrection and the promise of everlasting life. That leads us to our fifth and final truth that flows from resurrection. And that truth is that Jesus gives your life purpose. We'll look at the final verse. Mary Magdalene went And announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. Think of how truly extraordinary this is. Jesus commands Mary Magdalene to be the very first person who ever proclaims and announces the good news of Jesus Christ. And she announces this truth to the very apostles who will then go forth and announce this truth to the world. See, Jesus has done far more than just save Mary. He has sent Mary. Now Mary's life has an astronomical sense of value, honor, and purpose. And if you are a Christian, I want you to know that the resurrection of Jesus Christ gives your life purpose as well. Think about it this way. If this story is true, if this testimony of Christ's resurrection, this this account that has given hope to generations and centuries of Christians around the globe is indeed true, then nothing is more important than this truth and the coming of God's kingdom. And if nothing is more important than that truth, how extraordinary is it that God has actually invited us to be a part of his mission in the earth? Does that mean that you need to leave your job, go to seminary, and pledge yourself to vocational ministry? Not necessarily. But it does mean that you are very much called to be a missionary of sorts. You're called to declare the gospel with your words and to display the gospel with your lives to your neighbors and to the nations. It means that God, the God who saved you, has also sovereignly, providentially placed you wherever you are to declare the gospel. Because your family and your friends, they need Jesus. Those whom you work with need Jesus. Your neighborhood needs Jesus. Your city needs Jesus. And this broken world needs the hope of his resurrection. If you are a Christian, God has sent you to be a missionary in these contexts. He has not just saved you by grace. He has sent you by his grace. Now it's our turn, just like Mary, to bear witness to the resurrected Christ. See, the story recorded in this passage of Scripture is not just a story of Scripture. It is arguably the story of Scripture. It's because the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the central, it is the defining, it is the shocking climax of all of God's revelation. It is the shocking climax of all the story of the Bible. In fact, I find it fascinating that John makes sure to note that Mary mistakes Jesus for a gardener. Now, It's a really small, a very specific detail, but out of all the limited words that God has given us in Scripture to reveal himself, you might ask the question, 
Why is this significant? Well, I believe it's for starters that the story of the Bible, and indeed the story of humanity, also began in a garden. The book of Genesis teaches us how God made the first man named Adam and places him in a garden named Eden. He is created in the image and the likeness of God, and he is to be a steward that rules over God's good creation. But rather than living his life for the glory of God and the good of creation, Adam rejects the rule and reign of God by eating the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Rather than walking in communion with God and allowing God to determine and define what is good and true, Adam chooses to define good based on his own selfish desire. And there in the Garden of Eden, the world's first gardener shatters creation by his sin and plunges humanity into a destiny of death. And as Adam's descendants, we have repeated Adam's same sin over and over again. But here, in John chapter 20, the holy God of all creation steps into the story of sinful men. He steps into the story of sinful men, women, and children and reverses the curse. And he shows us that just as creation was once broken in a garden, new creation will be restored in a garden. For as in a garden, one man led humanity into sin. In this garden, one man will lead humanity into redemption. Through a gardener named Adam, we were doomed to death. But through this gardener named Jesus, we can be granted new and eternal life. As the book of Romans tells us, Therefore, as one trespass led to the condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Here in this garden, by the triumph of his resurrection, Jesus has become the new Adam, the second Adam, the true Adam, and in the words of the Apostle Paul, the last Adam. Jesus redeems Adam's story. That means he can redeem your story as well. The world is so anxious to divide us all according to the various identities and various subgroups. It's a way to divide us in hate. It's a way to keep us in a place of constant resentment towards one another. But really, there's only two groups of people that really matter. If you're an Adam or if you're found in Christ. Today, people of God, is a day where we celebrate resurrection. Today is an invitation to be found not in Adam, but in Christ, to step out of death and to eternal life. Easter is an invitation to all who would believe the good news that Jesus Christ is risen. Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you that you sent your Son into our brokenness. Thank you that you sent your Son into our pain and into our death, that through his resurrection, Death itself might be defeated. I ask now that the same Holy Spirit that rose Jesus unto new life would now move upon every heart in this room. You are the God who gives life to dead people. You are the Father who calls the prodigals home. Lord, would you do that now so that all who have heard the good news would respond with faith, with obedience, and with worship. Lord, thank you. Thank you that your Love is greater than our greatest sin. Thank you that you know your people by name. Lord, we worship you and we praise you. It's in Jesus' name, the name of our resurrected King, we pray. Amen.